Your Excellency, Madame Jeanette Kagame, First Lady of the Republic of Rwanda. Your Excellency, Madame Antoinette Sassungueso, First Lady of the Republic of Congo and Chair of OFLAD. Your Excellencies, First Ladies of the Republic of Botswana, Ghana, Niger, Mali, and Chad. Distinguished partners from the Global Fund, from the UN family, activists like myself from civil society, networks of people living with HIV AIDS, Awanyarwanda and Awanyarwanda Kazi Muraho. I know I am murdering your language, but I try. All protocol observed. It's a great honor and it's a privilege for me to be among you today in Kigali to give my first address as a new executive director of UN AIDS at this special session of OFLAD at the 20th ICASA. I want to first salute the remarkable leadership of African First Ladies and the work that you have done and continue to do for a stronger HIV response in Africa. Since its inception in 2002, with First Ladies from 18 countries, some of you still active today, UNAIDS has traveled hand in hand with OFLA to ensure that our children here in Africa are born HIV free and their mothers are kept healthy. First ladies have played and continue to play a great role of advocates, of agents from, for transformative change in our societies, driving political will and the need for social justice. Today, 17 years later, we must celebrate your tremendous efforts to eradicate mother-to-child transmission on the continent and for treatment coverage. The Free to Shine campaign that 22 of you have launched and are implementing in your respective countries is a concrete example of your leadership. Hey, you people, you don't want to clap for them? <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. Yeah, that's right. UNAIDS is currently supporting several of you to implement this campaign, and soon we're going to be sharing an HIV best practices toolkit to support you further. I've been asked to give an overview of the situation of HIV in Africa and where we stand in 2019. So here we go. Let me start with the good news. In 2018, Almost 38 million people were living with HIV globally. Out of those, 24 and a half were on treatment. That's a big achievement. Nearly four in five people living with HIV globally know their HIV status. That's big, that's big. Almost two thirds of all people living with HIV we're receiving life-saving ARV therapy. That's more than half, and, and more than half of those have suppressed viral loads. It, me it means they don't transmit. That's amazing, amazing. In Africa, Eastern and Southern Africa has shown huge progress, reducing AIDS-related deaths by 44% since 2010, and reducing new infections by 28% from 2010. Great progress. Six African countries reported achieving all the three 90s, the targets, and among them are three countries with very high burdens, Botswana, Eswatini, and Namibia. So we have seen significant progress in Africa. We've seen progress on reducing mother-to-child transmission in 23 focus countries. 85% of pregnant women living with HIV are now on ART, and that is up, from, up by 
43% since 2010. But, but, despite these successes, global reductions in HIV infections and AIDS-related deaths are getting smaller and smaller year by year. Momentum is slowing. And the epidemic is changing. In 2018, more than half of all new HIV populations were among what we call key populations. These are, so more than half of new infections are amongst these groups of people, sex workers, people who use drugs, gay men and other men who have sex with men, transgender people and prisoners and their partners. These groups of people are not testing, are not getting on treatment because their rights continue to be denied. It's also unacceptable that today 6,200 adolescent girls and young women are infected with HIV every week. Every week, 6,200 young women, girls, infected. We are letting them down. We can't let this happen. The Western and Central African region is lagging behind, especially for treatment coverage for pregnant women and for testing and treatment of children. Half of all children born with HIV who are not diagnosed early will die before their second birthday. In Northern Africa, we are seeing an alarming peak in new HIV infections, especially among adolescents who don't know their status. Young women and girls are at increased risk of HIV why? Because of harmful social norms and sexual and gender-based violence, especially in the humanitarian settings. Girls have limited knowledge of, uh, don't get comprehensive sexual education. So they lack the power, the knowledge to make informed decisions about their health. And many countries are refusing to introduce comprehensive sexual education for moral reasons, for really misguided reasons. This, this is a matter of life and death now. Girls need to have the information they need to live healthy sexual lives. When it comes to financing the HIV response, I'd like to salute the leadership, the efforts of the African Union. They've contributed, many member states, to the replenishment of the Global Fund. That's great. But, that's great, thank you. But the total funding for the HIV response globally has decreased by $1 billion in 2018. So there is still a big financing gap in AIDS response, and we need to keep stepping up. To improve health outcomes, we need more domestic resources invested in our health systems and in the HIV response. But these responses must be human rights focused, must be gender responsive for them to have their highest impact. At UNAIDS, we'll be looking closely at how to support governments to maintain their health spending in a context of debt rising in the context of austerity measures coming in. If I can give the example of Zambia, health spending has dropped by nearly 30% between 2015 and 2018, while debt repayments have increased by nearly 800%. We are making poor people, ill people, HIV people pay the price of debt. That is not right. So we must always work towards also removing the legal barriers and er eradicate the social norms, including child marriage, that put women and girls at risk. We need to work together to advocate for the removal of parental consent laws 
I keep saying, if I keep my right to stop my child from whatever, but the price is that my child is going to be exposed to risk and to die before they become an adult, what's the point of keeping this consent? So parental consent laws, we need to remove them so that and trust our children to make the right decisions. And of course, we need to keep girls in school. 50% of the risk to girls is reduced by just keeping girls in secondary school. So let's aim to put all our girls in a secondary school classroom. I do not underestimate the challenges. They are huge. But I'm excited about the opportunity of what we can all do together. Thank you, First Ladies for what you have done. Thank you for being part of this huge HIV movement and being a big driver of political will. We still need your leadership, your advocacy, your connection with communities, with opinion leaders, with religious leaders, your connection with civil society to keep HIV on top of the priori health priorities of our continent. I thank you so much.